Hello, and welcome to JFM. Our purpose is helping people take their right next step in their relationship with Jesus. We strive to create a community that is moving forward, showing the grace of Jesus in our neighborhoods and around the world. If you are new to JFM and would like to receive more information about who JFM is, becoming involved, or things happening in and around the church, we'd love to connect with you. To receive a mobile connection card, please text WELCOME to the number on the screen. This is also a great way to update us on any information changes, prayer requests, or ways we can help you take your right next steps. If you would like to give today or set up a reoccurring gift, there are multiple ways to do so. If you are here with us in person, there are giving boxes located at each exit to place your gift. If you wish to give electronically, simply visit jfmchurch.org give or download our mobile app for easy, secure giving. Good morning. It is great that summer has finally arrived and we are studying the book of Mark together. On Sunday, June 27th, we will be celebrating baptisms and also hosting a family fun day following the 9.30 and 11 o'clock services. Please sign up in the next steps area or on the website if baptism is your next right step. That Sunday, we will also be kicking off BBS, which starts on Monday. That fun day will include activities, games, and food on the church grounds. We are so happy that you are worshiping with us today. And today's that day, right? It's a day of celebration. If you didn't have a hot dog on the way in, you can have one on the way out. Would you guys stand up? We're going to sing about the God that we serve that breathes life into the very bones. We're going to prepare our hearts for baptism to see how God is moving in the hearts and lives of his people. We are excited that you guys came to do this with us.
whole creation You did not despise the cross For even in your suffering You saw to the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died What we came to do Praise the Come on! And the church rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born. Then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel and shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. pray for us. Father, thank you. Man, thank you for, for being here with us this morning. Thank you for all the things that we just sang together about, for your goodness and your grace, your love, your mercy, all these things, God, that, man, you could have easily held from us, but you're because of who you are, you came to us through your son, Jesus Christ. And so, God, our, our only natural response to that is just to praise you and to thank you for your grace and your goodness. And to unash unashamedly say we love you and thank you. And so we give ourselves to you in these moments, Lord, and we continue to ask you in a, in a in a posture of worship to speak to us, to fill us so that we can be better ambassadors for your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing today, good? How many of you had a hot dog on the way in? How many of you are gonna have one on the way out? Okay, good, because we can't have any leftovers, all right? How many of you went down the slide on the way in? How many of you are going to go down on the way out? No, no, no. Come on. I want to see some hands lifted up here. All right. All right. But anyway, we're so glad that you're here this morning and so glad that we could gather together to worship. Today, we have, we have a few things I just want to make mention of. The first is this. Next week, things are going to be a little different. It's a holiday weekend, 4th of July on Sunday. So instead of having... Um, 
the, our 9.30 hour and our 11 hour, we're just going to have one hour of worship, 9.30, okay? So if you come at 11 next week, sorry, okay? Sorry, but come at 9.30, come and worship um, to, with, our, with, uh, with everybody on that weekend. Pastor Angel's going to bring a great message, and, uh, and I just want to encourage you to, to please be a part of that. But please note the time change, okay? We'll do our best to, to continue to get that out. The second thing I want you to know is today is one of my favorite days uh, because today we're going to have some baptisms this morning. Yeah, the last service, it was awesome. We had baptisms in our last service. And, and today we have a father and a daughter that are going to be baptized together. And I just love that. And it's going to be so good. It's going to be so good. And then, of course, you already see as you walked in, things are a little different. We want you to stick around. And uh, as a continuation of our worship, right, is community and fellowship and hanging out and doing life together. And so we would love for you to, to spend some time, some spend some time with us after the service and, uh, and just get to know some new friends, all right? So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me, please, to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 6, all right? If you go, well, where's Mark? Mark's in the New Testament right at the beginning, It's one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're in chapter 6 of of the Gospel of Mark. And if you're new to us and you go, um, let me just kind of tell you what we're doing. We, We typically take a large chunk of Scripture throughout the summer, and we just walk through it together. And this year, we're walking through the Gospel of Mark. We're going to do all 16 chapters. So this is going to take us all the way through Labor Day weekend. And, uh, and we're super excited about that. God's been doing some really cool things in people's lives. And, and, and the challenge that we laid out for you is, is simply this. Come on Sunday and hear that chapter, a portion of that chapter taught. And then throughout the week, I hope you'll take Mark chapter 6 and you'll use that as your devotional platform. That you'll just spend some time reading it and rereading it and praying through those scriptures and seeing what God, what God is teaching to you. You know, as we've said from the get-go, the gospel of Mark is a pretty fast-paced, moving um, gospel. It's action-packed. You know, Mark is is very much concerned about showing you who Jesus is by how Jesus lived and what Jesus did. And and so in this little chapter in in, uh, Mark 6, there's a lot happening. I mean, the first section of this chapter, you see Jesus going back to his hometown of Nazareth. And he begins to teach and he begins to talk about who he is and lay out this foundation uh, of, of, of God's kingdom. And you know, and you know how, what it's like. I mean, Jesus goes back to his hometown and people are like, wait a second. Isn't this Joseph's son? Wasn't he a carpenter? Who does he think he is telling us how to live? And says they got mad at Jesus and they actually ran him out of town. And Jesus was just dumbfounded by their lack of faith. Then after that little story, you have Jesus jumping into sending out his disciples. He sends his disciples out on their own little missionary or ministry tours, two by two, village to village, proclaiming the good news and the kingdom that's coming. And uh, Jesus gave his disciples authority over demons and and authority to to heal. And and so you hear about that. And then Mark jumps into uh, the the story of John the Baptist, who is... uh, who is martyred for his faith. If you remember, John the Baptist is the guy who prepared the way for Jesus' ministry to come. And he was not only a partner in ministry with Jesus, he was also Jesus' cousin. And so, you know, you, you have Jesus who loves his cousin and loves his partner in ministry. And this is a guy who prepared the way for Jesus to come on the scenes. And now he's, his life is taken from him be, because of his ministry. And so there's this moment of, ooh. In the middle of this chapter. Then after Jesus, you know, gets back, his disciples get back from the ministry tour. And after John the Baptist had been beheaded, you know, Jesus says to his disciples, let's just go away. We got to get out of here. And so they, they take off and, and they're trying to go to a remote place to get some rest. That precedes this miracle that is, is one of the few miracles that's, that's listed in all four of the gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. Where Jesus took five loaves and two fish and and fed a multitude of people. After the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus, you see how quick paced this is, right? Jesus, Jesus sends his disciples out on a boat and he goes up on a mountain and he begins to pray. 
And what happens is, as he's praying, a storm, another storm, right, comes to the disciples that are out in the Sea of Galilee. This time, Jesus isn't with them. So in order to get to them, how does he get to them? He walks on water. Could you imagine that? And the disciples, I love how it says, they thought they were seeing a ghost. So would you. Right? Jesus walks out on water. You know, he calms the storm, calms some things inside of his disciples. His disciples are once again in awe of Jesus. He's in the boat with them. Now they go to the other side, and it says that this time on the other side, the people recognized who Jesus was, and instead of asking him to leave, they flocked to him, and revival broke out in the Decapolis. That is a lot to unpack in a little chapter, isn't it? And tucked away in this chapter is a, is a beautiful picture of Jesus' heart that every single time I read it, it grips me. Every single time I read it, 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 it just, it, I have to pause and I have to think about it because, because it, it, it just is a, it may, it's an, I'm in awe of it. You know, remember, Jesus' ministry partner and his cousin had just been martyred. Remember, Jesus' disciples had just got back from their ministry tour. And, and Jesus is no doubt overwhelmed with his grief, and he's no doubt overwhelmed with some of the events. There's no doubt he's excited also. So there's these conflicting emotions that he may have. He's no doubt excited to hear about the stories his disciples have. And, and it says he wants to get away. Let's pick this up in, in verse 30. Of, of Mark chapter 6. Listen to what it says. It says, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to, started to report to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, you know, you know if you were a part of a Jewish funeral, <laughs> Right? Or there was, some, you know, there was lots of people coming and growing. This was, this was like a long, a, a long grieving process. People were coming. People were going. People were talking about John the Baptist. It's his cousin. You know, people are probably flocked to the disciples because of what they did. Lots of people are coming at Jesus. Jesus says they didn't even have a chance to eat. That's how crazy this was. And so Jesus says to them, hey, gang, let's get into a boat and let's go away. Let's go to a, the other side Let's go to a quiet place and let's get some rest. How many of you have a place that is your place of retreat? Do you have a place of retreat? You know, my, for me, my place is the Upper Peninsula. Every year I go to this little town. You've heard me talk about it. It's called Grand Marais. I love it because when I hit the bridge, like this thing doesn't work very good. Right, and I can't get phone calls, and I can't get very many emails, and I don't get a lot of text messages. I just don't get bothered. I just go away, and I retreat. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's overwhelmed, but yet his, he wants to hear from his disciples, and, and he can't even eat because so many people are flocking to him. And he says, gang, can we just go away? You know, the, the reality is he's wanting to do what? Get away from people to refuel and to refocus and to rest but what happens next, this is the portion of the scripture that I want to I focus in on. Because every single time I read it, it just gives me one of those, oh, like, wow moments. In verse 32, as Jesus is trying to get away from the crowds, it says this. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of him. And here's what I want you to hear. When Jesus landed, got to the other side, he saw the large crowd, and he did what? He had compassion on them. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. The reality is, it's a good thing this story was not written about Jason. Right? I mean, if I'm trying to get away from people and if I'm overwhelmed and I need to get to a solitary place and I go and all of a sudden I see these people on the other side of the shore, what would your first reaction be? Probably the same as mine, like, ugh, are you serious? You're the people I'm trying to get away from. You know, you're the people that are bringing me a headache here, right? I mean, you're the people I gotta, I just gotta, I gotta get some rest. But instead of being grumpy and instead of being angry, instead of being frustrated, Jesus was filled with what? Compassion. Why? Because they were like sheep 
without a shepherd. So what does Jesus do? The rest of the story, this is what precedes the feeding of the 5,000. The rest of the story is this. Jesus spent time with them from morning till evening doing what? It says taught them many things. He taught them. He cared for them. He nurtured them. He provided for them. You know, from morning till evening, Jesus sat down, and it says a a group of more than 5,000 people came, and he taught them. And what I love about this story is this. It says that Jesus taught them. He fed them. He fed them spiritually and he fed them emotionally. But then what does he do? He feeds them physically. And in verse 42, at the end of this little section here, it says, all who were with Jesus were fully satisfied. I love that. Jesus is the compassionate shepherd. I love that image. Jesus is the compassionate shepherd. But just for clarification's sake, if Jesus is the shepherd, what does that make us? Sheep, right? And you go, oh, that's so sweet, right? Sheep, I mean, they're so fluffy and they're so cute. No, that's not a, that's not a compliment. <laughs> Sheep are the dumbest animals on the planet. Did you know that? In fact, in fact, let me just give you some, let me give you some qualities or characteristics of sheep. You know, so when, is this, sheep get easily lost. You know, sheep get easily lost. How many of you in here are directionally challenged? Right, I see, I see wives nudging their all over the place, right? You're directionally challenged. Sheep get lost. Sheep wander. But, but here's what I think is important for us to see is this lost that we're talking about from a spiritual sense is this. It's not directionally, it's spiritually. And listen to what the Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 6. It says, we all, we all, you, me, all of us, like what? Sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned our own way. You know, this is what you're going to hear in a second through the story of baptism. It's, it's their story. It's my story. For those of us who have come to Jesus, it's all of our story. You know, we're, we're going to hear that without Jesus, we are spiritually lost. And this is, why, this is why when Jesus landed on the other side of the shore and he saw the crowd gather around him, he, he looked at them with compassion because he saw that they were lost. The second thing is this, sheep are defenseless. You know, the, real, the really interesting thing to me is this. Do you know that sheep are one of the few animals that don't have a natural means of defense? I mean, some animals, they can kick or some can run or some can camouflage themselves. Some, some can fly away. Sheep can't do nothing. I mean, they just roll over, right? I mean, sheep have no natural defense. And you know what is so interesting to me when I read through the scripture Here's what it reminds me of, is that I am in and you are in a spiritual battle. You know, that, that you are in a spiritual battle. And in my, my flesh, right, in my flesh I am weak, Scripture says. But in my spirit I am strong. In my natural flesh I am weak to the enemy's attacks against me, to temptation, to sin, to the lure and pull of this world. In my flesh I am weak. That's why the Bible says that our enemy, our spiritual enemy, is is prowls like what? A roaring lion looking to do what? Devour. Because in our flesh, we're weak. This is why the Bible says this, that that without the backing of the body of Christ, the church, man, this is the blessing of being connected to the church. This is why we will beat this drum over and over and over again about you being connected into a small group and you being connected to people because there's strength in numbers, That without the armor of God, right, what does the Apostle Paul say? That our wrestle isn't against flesh and blood. It's against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly spiritual realms. You go, what? Yeah, there's a battle raging right now for your soul. You know, and without putting on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, taking up our shield of faith and the sword of the spirit without putting on the armor of God that's laid out for us in scripture, we are defenseless to these things. Without the protection of the good shepherd, on our own, we are very vulnerable and susceptible to the attacks of the evil one. In our flesh, we are weak. In our spirit, we are strong. It's important to see. Sheep are also very stubborn Look at the person next to you and say, I think they're talking about you, right? Okay, 
I think they're talking about you. In the name of Jesus, say that, right? I mean, in kind spirit. But the reality is this. We are stubborn. You're stubborn. I'm stubborn. You're prideful. I'm prideful. The Bible says this. It's our pride that leads us to the fall, right? Sheep are stubborn. We're stubborn. Here's the last thing. Sheep are filthy. You ever driven past a sheep farm? Don't. It's disgusting. Right? They stink. If your windows are down, you're going to want to roll them up real fast, okay? And if I can be, if I can say this very respectfully, because of our sin, the Bible lays this out too, and it says in the, in the, in the presence of a perfect and holy God, we are filthy. We're filthy because of our sin. But I love the way that it's put in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. It says this, no matter how deep the stain of our sin, God says, I can remove it. Don't miss this. God says, I can remove it. He says, I can make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Even if you are stained as red as crimson, I can make you as white as wool. Sin has left its mark on our lives. Sin has left its mark in our families' lives. Sin has left its mark in our community and in our world, right? It just has. But the compassionate shepherd can remove that stain of sin. There's new life under the protection of the shepherd. The bottom line is this. And this is what I want you to hear before we moved in to talking about the shepherd. Sheep need a shepherd. This is why, this is why it's really good news when Jesus, in making these statements in, in the gospel of John, these I am statements, these stake in the ground things, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the vine. I am the gate. And what does he say? I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. And what does a shepherd do? He lays his life down for his sheep. And the good shepherd, and as the good shepherd, he has compassion and love for his sheep. So what I want to do with the rest of our time, I just want to talk real quickly, real quickly, I want to talk to you about the qualities and the characteristics of the shepherd. And I want to use probably most notably the, the, most, the most notable chapter in scripture on the shepherd from Psalm 23. In fact, here's what I want us to do together. Can we do this? I'm going to put this up on the screen. This is Psalm 23. And I just want us as sort of to get our hearts wrapped around this. Let's just read this together out loud, okay? Can we do that? All right, cool. Let's do it. All right, here we go. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Don't you love that? Look at the characteristics of the good shepherd. You know, and this really, if you were to continue, and hopefully this week you'll, you'll take some time to unpack Mark chapter 6. But these are the characteristics and the qualities that you're seeing Jesus display to those who came to him in Mark 6. But if you're taking notes, write these things down. The first is the compassionate shepherd guides his sheep. Guides his sheep. Right, as sheep are easy and susceptible to being lost, the good shepherd is our guide. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. And in verse 3, what does he say? He guides me down right paths for his name's sake. The Lord guides and he directs and he leads. I mean, do you ever find yourself kind of wandering or you feel like, man, I just wish I knew which direction I should go. Or I'm at a crossroads and I'm like, Where should, what, should, what should happen or what, what should I turn right or should I turn left? You know, you're facing temptation. Should I go this way or should I go that way? The Bible says that when we seek the Lord with all of our heart, right, that he will lead us as the shepherd. This is why I love the wisdom of Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, where Solomon, in his great understanding of life, he says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
Lean not on your own understanding, right? Trust in the Lord's way. I mean, have you ever gotten to a point in your life where you have, you're at a cross and you go, I can go what God lays out in scripture or I can go what I feel in the moment. That's what Solomon is saying. He's saying, listen, trust in the Lord's leading, not in your own understanding, right? He says, in all your ways, in everything that we do, acknowledge him, trust him, and he will make our paths straight. This is one of the roles of the good shepherd, to make our paths straight. But you see how that's done? Right, that's done as we connect, as we engage, as we press in, as we like to say here, as we give God our yes to his word and to his way. You know, have you ever been in a, have you ever been in a room full of people that you're just unfamiliar with? Maybe you're like, yeah, I came here today and I'm unfamiliar with people. I get it. Right, but I mean, as you walk into a room and you're, maybe you're unfamiliar with people and all of a sudden you hear a voice in the crowd that you recognize you, and you go, oh, and what are you? You're drawn to that voice, right? You're drawn, drawn to the voice that you, you recognize. You know, this last Christmas, um, Amy and I had got to go and see um, our first little foster baby and we got to take her some gifts. And we got, to, we got to meet her family that she's with now. It was awesome. It was just incredible. And so as we were driving there, I remember thinking, I wonder if she's even going to know who we are. I mean, we only had her five weeks. But in those five weeks, man, we, we held her and we loved her and we nurtured her. She was in special care nursery. And we would drive up before we even took her home. And I would sit with her at my lunchtime. And we'd go, I'd go up after work. And, you know, one of us was there from like five at night till midnight. And we would just hold this little one in the hospital. We just loved on her. She's a little bitty, bitty thing. And I remember we walked into the house. And I saw her in a little extra saucer thing. And I'm like, oh, hey. And I called her by name. And I'm like, oh, it's so, look at, she's growing up. It's so cool, you know. And all of a sudden, she just, whoa. She turned in a little extra saucer. And she looked up at me. And she put her hands up. And her aunt, who's with, she goes, I think she recognizes your voice. Oh, you talk about a moment, right? I think she recognizes your voice. And I look at this and I see this. And, and one of the things that I love about this and, is, is Jesus says this, my sheep know my voice. That's my question for you. Do you know the voice of the shepherd? Do you know the voice of the shepherd? When you're at a crossroads, can you hear? Do you take time to listen for what God may be speaking into that situation? You go, well, how do I hear God's voice? Man, through prayer, by getting into his word, by listening to what God has to say to you. I mean, I say this all the time. We sit knee to knee and eye to eye with Jesus when we sit down and we do time with him and his word. And we just listen and these words that come off the page. The Bible says these are living and active words words. And when we're at a crossroads and all of a sudden what you're going to see is the more you do this is these words are going to start coming into your mind. When you're at a crossroads, you go, whoa, maybe God is speaking to me in that moment. Or through prayer, maybe God will prompt you into something. Or maybe you surround yourself with the right people who are on the same journey that you are. And all of a sudden they begin to speak into a situation. And you go, oh, is this God speaking into the situation? The Bible says this, be still and know that I am God. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and the sheep know my voice. The second thing is the compassionate shepherd provides for his sheep. The compassionate shepherd provides for his sheep. Look at what David, King David has to say about the shepherd in verses one through three of Psalm 23. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Now, two weeks ago, I asked you an important question as we looked at a different section of this gospel. This was a section of Jesus calming the storm. And I asked you, how many of you have, are walking through a storm or are walking through a storm with somebody else or see a storm coming on the horizon? And about three quarters of our hands went up in the air. And I'm not surprised by that. Because Jesus says in, in John 16, he says, I've told you all these things so that you may have peace in me. In this world, you will have trouble. Thanks. <laughs> in this world, you will have trouble. But Jesus says, fear not. I've overcome the world. The reality is we live in an imperfect world, don't we? 
know, this is why Jesus' coming was so necessary and so right. But what we see is that peace, this is what Jesus is saying to us through his word. Peace isn't dependent upon perfect circumstances, right? Because there are no perfect circumstances in the presence of the imperfect. Our peace doesn't come from circumstances being perfect. Our peace comes from the, 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 our peace comes from the one that we place our trust in who is, is perfect and has overcome the imperfect world. And this is what David is saying in Psalm 23. David's life was not perfect. I mean, David did some extremely stupid things. I mean, go back. You should read about his life. I mean, you, you'll feel really good about yours. Read about his life. But yet he was a man after God's own heart. I mean, he did some incredibly dumb things. Some of the things that brought chaos into his life were because of his choice. But yet there were also some things, just like us, there are things that are out of control or that, that aren't because of us, maybe because of somebody else's choice, right? I mean, there, there, there's just things that we have going on here. But I, but I love what, 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 what David does is he recognizes the goodness of God's provision, he recognizes that God and only God could quiet his spirit and make him lay down in green pastures. He recognizes that God and only God had the power to quench what his life and his soul thirsted for, right, in the quiet streams. He recognized that God and only God could leave his heart longing for nothing. Hey, guys. Sorry. Okay. Right? And what I want you to see is this. Jesus doesn't just provide for you physically. We see this in the story. Jesus provides for you spiritually and emotionally too. And here's the third thing. The compassionate shepherd, he protects his sheep. You know, he leads, he guides, he provides, and he protects. This is what David says in verses 4 through 6. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though... I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Why? David says, because you are with me. Listen, when he, he's with me, I have nothing to fear. You know, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Remember who's in your boat, right? Remember who's in your boat. And when he's with me, I'm at rest in the soul, regardless of the circumstances. And David says this, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And he says, and you, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I want you to hear this, because this is big. Breaking bread, right? We're going to break some bread together at the end of the service, right? But breaking bread or having a meal or sharing a meal with somebody in the Old Testament, there was an Old Testament tradition in homes that where guests were allowed to stay at the table of the host as long as the host kept filling your cup, right? Have you ever had that awkward tension like, should I stay, should I go? Or maybe you're the host and you're like, why are they not leaving, right? They've overstayed their welcome, Right? It was beautiful. We should bring this tradition back. And the Old Testament was, if as long as the host kept filling your cup, you could stay. When you finished your cup and the host was just, the host was just kind of going, time for you to leave. Right? Enough said. You know? And here's what David says. I love this. about. Here's what he says about God. David says this, my cup overflows. In other words, David is reminding us that we're always welcome at the table of the Lord. We're always welcome in the presence of the Lord. Don't you just love that? The invitation into Jesus' presence is always yes and always come. It's just stay near. It's just come on in because you're, you're not only welcome, but you're covered and you're protected by the compassionate shepherd. In fact, David closes this psalm by saying this, surely his goodness and his mercy will do what? Will follow me all the days of my life here and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you see what a good and compassionate shepherd we have in Jesus? I hope so. In fact, there's a parable in the Gospels that says this, that Jesus, you know, he's so good that if he had 100 sheep and one of them were to wander off by himself, Jesus would leave the 99 and go find the one. That's how much he loves you, and that's how much he loves me, and that's how much he loves us, because he's a good 
and compassionate shepherd. And the good news is he doesn't leave us lost. He doesn't see us lost, hopeless, stubborn, and filthy. What Jesus sees us as and what, 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 what enabled him and what, what inspired him to leave heaven and come to this earth was simply this. He sees you and he sees me as valuable and lovable, worthy to come to and worth giving his life for. This is what Jesus says in John 10, right? The good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. Why? So that the sheep can be found again and brought into the Father's fold. That's beautiful. And this morning, we're going to close our time together with, with a, the, my favorite thing is baptism. And what you're going to hear is a couple of stories. I was lost. Now I'm found. You know, I was in a rut, man. Now I'm set free. I, I, was, I was unsettled. Now I'm at peace. I was, I was dead to my sin, now I'm made fully alive in Christ. I was thirsty, and Jesus is fully satisfied because the compassion of the good shepherd changes everything. So are you ready? Are you ready for baptisms? Right? Now remember, listen. I told you, we're, we're going to have a little party out here, but this is really where the party is right now. And as you hear these stories, you're going to hear uh, stories from my buddy Matthew, and you're going to hear a story from his daughter London. And I've just gotten to know these guys over the last little bit, a couple weeks. I'm telling you, I love these guys. And you're going to hear their stories, and we're going to cheer like crazy for them. Because God is doing some great things in our life, all right? So let me pray for you and pray for this time, and then we're going to baptize. Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for being here with us. And thank you for your love and for your grace. You know, thank you for being a good shepherd that leads us and guides us and directs us. In fact, I just want to pause in the middle of this prayer and ask you a question. Do you know the shepherd? Have you, have you put your faith and your trust in Jesus? Man, if you're here today and you just say, I, I feel like I've been wandering lost or, or wandering aimlessly. I feel like I've been defenseless and been beat up and temptation's getting the best of me. Or I feel like... I feel like I'm filthy because of my sin. The good shepherd is calling you today, I'm telling you. And here's his, his words to you this morning. He says, come to me if you're weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Because that's what the shepherd does. And so if you're here this morning, just pausing in the middle of this prayer and you're saying, Jason, I, I know that I need Jesus in my life. I'm going to continue this prayer and you just jump on with this and you just sincerely tell him this say Jesus I need you tell him Jesus I need you I ask you to come into my life and Jesus forgive me and from this day forward Jesus I want to follow you because I believe your way is right and good and that your grace is sufficient for me Jesus, I want to pray for those who may have jumped on that prayer and invited you into their life. The beauty of this day is that, that you are with them. And surely your goodness and your mercy will follow them all the days of their life as they dwell. And they will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the promise from the good shepherd. So Jesus, be with us today as we celebrate this new life that we, we see in you through London and Matthew's story. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's hear these stories. London Grenage. I have lots and lots of family who don't care to go to church and don't at least try to go to church. I want to be the first person to stop up and take time to read the Bible and know Jesus as my Savior. I want my family to know through me that Jesus forgives. I know I am doing this for the right reason and that I am becoming one with Jesus. I want to get baptized so I can be the one who makes changes and has a better life and leave the past behind. I'm not perfect, but it's okay not to be perfect because I know I'm forgiven and that Jesus loves me. Here. There you go, girl. Hop in here. This is my friend London. She's awesome. 
And a couple days ago, yeah, a couple days ago, we sat down together and we, and we had a really cool talk. And London said to me, I want to just, I want to know that I'm right with Jesus. Remember you saying that? And we talked about that. And you said, I'm ready to say yes. And so my word for you as I've been praying like crazy this morning for London is, is that you just keep moving forward. Right? What do you say in your story? I want my family to know. I want to be a pace setter in my family. You know, you talked about how you want to be an example to your mom and your brothers and sisters, right? And that's a really beautiful thing. And so we're going to celebrate the new work that God has done in London's life by baptizing you today, okay? I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Matthew Grenage. My journey to Jesus has been a roller coaster ride. I knew where I was supposed to go and that Jesus was the right way, but I've spent a lot of time on with Jesus and then off with Jesus. I spent so much time hoping for the highs that I ignored my lows. And even for a few seconds, I convinced myself that I was happy even though it was temporary. I grew up in the church. I went to Queens and St. Mary's and Lumen Christi until I moved to Arizona. When I left home to, and got to Arizona, it seemed like I was free to make my own choices. And one of the choices I made was to go to a public school. As the years went by, I slowly got out of my routine and the solid relationship I had with God faded fast. Fast forward. I became a father and tried my very best to be a good partner, but there was always something missing deep in my heart. I could feel myself becoming darker and darker as the years passed by. A few years later, and back here in Jackson, I started working at a video game store with someone who attended JFM. Every time I was around him, his energy and his overall compassion toward other people was something I truly admired. Not only was I curious to understand why he was this way, but I found out that he was part of JFM and that he spent a year doing mission work. Every time he told me a story about the mission trip he was on and some wild place he went in the world, I couldn't wait to hear another one. Noticing I was curious about his faith, he invited me to join him for a small group at JFM. At first, I was extremely reluctant. Not because I didn't believe in God, I just felt like I had drifted so far away from God. Finally, I decided to come, and at first I thought I didn't belong. But once I allowed myself to listen, I started to feel full, and I wanted to know more about Jesus. I could feel his presence, and I even started crying. I was so surprised that I cried. I remember getting on Google and asking if it was normal to cry during church. I found out it wasn't uncommon. But being a single father, I realized that there were a lot of things inside of me that I wanted to change. I wanted to make sure that whenever my kids looked at me, they knew that I was there to protect them but that Jesus was all they needed. So recently I've made the decision to give my life fully to Jesus. I want them to know that salvation is what we all need. I'm really thankful that I found this church and I'm grateful for those who have helped me reconnect with Jesus. I undoubtedly believe that he has forgiven my sins. I undoubtedly believe that he is my savior. I feel renewed every time I leave church. I love to sing and praise Jesus. I still cry, but that's okay. 
because I know he loves me. All right. Have fun here, brother. You know, you said it in your story, Matthew, but the word that I prayed this morning that just kept coming to me is renewed. You know, and I think those tears are just a release. You know, I'm crying. Stephen cries all the time. <laughs> right? But that's a good thing. Man, and God is doing a good work. You know, one of the things you kept saying to me is, I want to be a good dad, and you are, brother. You're doing a great, you're doing a great job. And we're so glad that we get to come alongside you and see this new work that God's doing in your life. So let me pray over you. Matthew, we just pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to be with you, lead you, direct you, guide you. We thank you, for God, for the, the work that you're doing in his life, for the tender heart that you've given to my friend. And we just ask, Lord, that as he continues to seek you in all things, he would find you in all things. That you are his provider, his protector. You are his shepherd and his leader. And we thank you, Lord, for this day, for the encouragement he is to each of us. We pray in your name. Amen. Matthew, I baptize you today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You gotta carry this part. My story for His glory. I need a rest. I soon will say. The chains break at the weight of your glory. 
I needed shelter, I was a poor I don't know if you saw this or not, but how fitting that we had some confetti from Easter fall out of the, fall out of the ceiling, right? <laughs> I thought that was so awesome. It's like floating down. It's still here. All right. Guys, God is good, isn't he? Isn't he good? And you know the cool thing is, is we get to spend some time together just continuing to proclaim that goodness through our fellowship. Right, going out, just hanging out, having a good time together. That's a part of worship. I don't want us to undersell that. That's a part of our worship. Thanking God for what he's done, thanking God for who he is, and then joining together in the fellowship of the saints, right? Breaking bread, having fun. So I'm gonna encourage you to hang out with us, okay? But I also, I also want you to just understand the significance of this day. Man, we just celebrated from death to life. Man, from death to life. And that's what Jesus does. And so. If you made a decision to follow Jesus today, come find me, go out to our next steps area, and let us know because we wanna come alongside you and celebrate the new work that God's doing in you, all right? Guys, what time is service next week? 9.30, all right, we'll see you. Have a great one. We'll see you outside.